Good morning and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for the launch of our senior study group report on China's impact on conflict dynamics in South Asia, which is available now on the USIP website. As many of you know, the United States Institute of Peace was founded by Congress in 1984 as a national, nonpartisan, independent institute dedicated to the pursuit of a world without violent conflict. We do this work from our headquarters in Washington, DC, as well as in our field offices around the world, where our amazing country teams work closely with local partners to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict. My name is Jennifer Statz, and I'm the director for East and Southeast Asia programs at USIP, where our China program focuses on China's impact on conflict dynamics around the world. This report examines China's interests, activities, and influence in South Asia, and provides recommendations for ways the US government and other stakeholders might take these factors into account when devising their own policies and strategies to prevent and manage conflict in the region. This report is part of a broader series of USIP senior study group reports examining China's influence in different conflicts around the world. For each SSG, we convene a bipartisan group of senior experts over a period of five to six months to examine China's role in a specific conflict or region. The first study group looked at China's role in Myanmar's internal conflicts. The second looked at China's role in North Korea, and the third looked at China's influence in the Red Sea arena. This is our fourth report in the series and was a joint effort between several programs at USIP, including the China program, the South Asia and Pakistan programs, and the Afghanistan program. We were incredibly fortunate to have an amazing group of experts participating in this project. First and foremost, of course, are our two extraordinary co-chairs, Randy Shriver and Rick Olson. As most of you know, Randy Shriver is the chairman of the board at the Project 2049 Institute and recently served as Assist Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. He also serves on a number of boards, was a founding partner of Armitage International, and served as an active duty naval intelligence officer. Our second co-chair, Rick Olson, had a long and distinguished career as a foreign service officer, including recent posts as U.S. Ambassador to Pakistan, as well as U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Most importantly, of course, he is currently a senior advisor with the Asia Center at USIP. We benefited from the expertise of other outstanding group members, all of whom provided thoughtful contributions in our meetings over the last six months and throughout the report writing process. Several of them will be speaking later on on the panel, but I wanted to read the names of all of our members to make sure their contributions are recognized. Our senior study group participants included Cara Abercrombie, Alyssa Ayers, Dan Blumenthal, Patrick Cronin, Jacqueline Deal, Evan Feigenbaum, Sajit Gandhi, Sheena Greitens, Shezi Khan, Samir Lalwani, Tanvi Madan, Anya Manuel, Dan Markey, Peter Mattis, Dave Rank, Danny Russell, Tamana Salakuddin, Milanthi Samaranayaka, Vikram Singh, Andrew Small, Ashley Tellis, Dustin Walker, and Andrew Wilder. We thank all of them for their time and their commitment over the last six months and extend our appreciation to many others who provided additional support along the way. Special thanks has to go to Jacob Stokes, uh, who will be leading the discussion later today, who did a terrific job leading and coordinating this effort. So this morning, we'll hear a brief overview of the report from our co-chairs, followed by a conversation among several of the members of the senior study group themselves about some of the main themes, findings, and recommendations in the report. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us, and I'm happy to turn things over to our co-chairs, Randy Shriver and Rick Olson. Great, well, thank you, Jennifer. And let me just start by thanking the team at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, it was really a, a terrific effort, and, and Jennifer, thank you, and Vikram, and and Jacob uh, and uh, Lucy Stevenson Young also just a tremendous job organizing the group and our meetings and of course drafting the report and all the editing and, and getting us across the finish line. Let me also thank the members of this uh, study group team. You know, I'm actually a Portland Trailblazers fan and we passed up Michael Jordan in the draft, but I felt like every time we met, I was taking the court with the 1990 Bulls. This is just all stars everywhere people making tremendous contributions and really just producing outstanding products. And third, let me thank uh, my co-chair, Ambassador Olson, who was just a, a great colleague throughout this and somebody from whom I learned a lot as well, which is when you do a project like this, uh, when you when you take away more than you think you contribute, it's, it's always a good thing for you personally. And I learned an awful lot from Rick, so thank you. So I came to this project as a 
national security professional who's really been a China watcher uh, all the way back to the late 80s when I joined the Navy as an intelligence officer. So uh, I'll start the briefing today on this report by focusing on uh, China's activities, China's interests, China's activities and and uh, approaches to South Asia, uh, the impact that that has on um, U.S. interests and and how that informs U.S.-China strategic competition. I think Ambassador Olson will speak a little bit more directly on the impact and interests of South Asian states and their receptivity to China's approaches and, and potential U.S. policy adjustments, given his very deep background in South Asia. So beginning with China, uh, China's ties to the region are, are of course, longstanding, and given its size and geography, uh, that's that's been the case for a long time, but their efforts to, to deepen ties and expand activities really uh, expanded and, and accelerated in the first part of the century and probably accelerated even further under the leadership of General Secretary Xi Jinping. They have a number of, of interests that serve as drivers. Some of them are very core interest to them, sovereignty interests. So one thing that informs their approach to South Asia is, of course, their interest in protecting their Western non-Han territories, the areas of Xinjiang and Tibet. So really a core interest of theirs. They also seek to manage their growing rivalry with India, which involves both confrontation and engagement. They do seek to manage uh, India-Pakistan tensions, even as they lean more in the direction of Pakistan, their long-term partner. They seek to increase access opportunities for the PLA, particularly their naval forces, with the intent of not only promoting their own economic interests and security interests, but preventing India or some combination of India, the U.S., or others from uh, dominating the Indian Ocean region. But I think in the broadest sense, as our discussions uh, in this group uh, often highlighted, in, in the broadest sense, the PRC and the CCP leadership are really trying to construct a more China-centric order and to minimize the role of others, including the United States, from shaping and influencing the region in ways that would impact their interests in, in negative ways from their perspective. Now, not surprisingly, they are increasing activities and these activities uh, cut across a number of domains. Their approach is cut across the diplomatic, economic, and military domains. Now, regarding diplomacy, the PRC is investing more heavily in its long-term partner, Pakistan, as I mentioned. Now, some of this has been opportunistic of late as they've seen the souring of U.S.-Pakistan relations, um, but they've also in, in many ways seen this as a way to complicate India's interests and divert their resources and attention as China seeks to gain advantage in their rivalry uh, with India. On the economic front, this report talks a great deal about the land-based and maritime aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative. These are, of course, tools that are designed to increase Beijing's influence and standing throughout the region, uh, not just development assistance programs. Uh, much more can be said about this and much more will be said about this by subsequent speakers. And on the military front, we see the PLA, particularly the Navy, the, the PLA Navy being much more active in areas of the so-called far seas as they refer to them. Uh, and this would include of course the Indian Ocean. Now, this report contains a, a terrific timeline of Chinese military activities in the Indian Ocean region that I would commend to the audience and any readers that, that gives a very good overview of how they've been increasing their presence and their activities. Now, with respect to U.S.-China strategic competition, I think Washington is and should be uh, increasingly concerned that the PRC does aspire to create a region that is more deferential to Beijing's ambitions, as I said. So our report focuses on a number of ways Washington can counter or thwart those activities that are malign and inimical to our interests, while also attempting to preserve space for cooperation where our interests do align, for example, in helping to manage uh, tensions in places like the India-Pakistan border and Afghanistan. This will obviously be increasingly difficult in an, envir in an environment of US-China competition, so we spent uh, some time thinking about those issues. The report discusses ways the U.S. can set priorities for engagement in South Asia, recognizing that we'll be resource constrained. And so we talked about approaches to the smaller states of South Asia. 
Uh, we say a little bit can go a long way, but of course you got to have a little bit as the minimum price of entry. So how to do that in, in smart ways that really uh, are oriented toward the interests of those states and not seen as solely a, a means by which we're trying to compete with China. Uh, we talk about the broadening of U.S. engagement with South Asia to fully integrate it into the free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Now, I'm sure uh, the incoming Biden administration will, will rebrand or attempt to uh, articulate its own view for the Indo-Pacific, but surely the key pillars that have been formulated in the Trump administration and in, in, in the rebalance and pivot to Asia in the Obama administration, surely those key pillars will, will be sustained in some form. So we think it's important that South Asia be fully brought into that and integrated into that. We talk about some very specific and concrete ways to deepen ties with India. Uh, people often talk about the need to strengthen ties with India. We add a lot of specificity to it across domains. We talk about the need to rebalance relations with Pakistan, to not solely be focused on the military, the military relationship and the security issues such as counterterrorism, but how to introduce the economic issues that will help support good governance and, and counter corruption. And finally, we do recognize that while we compete with China and the areas of contestation are in fact expanding beyond East Asia and into South Asia, we want to compete in a way that's benign. And so we, we looked at how to enhance crisis management modalities that account for the need to do so, have, have crisis management modalities and environment of, of increasing competition and how that can work more effectively where we need it. So that's a very brief introduction of some aspects of the report. And uh, I'm happy at this point to turn it over to Ambassador Olson to continue with the briefing. Um, thanks very much, Randy. And let me also um, express my appreciation uh, to all the people who made this report uh, possible, um, starting, starting with you, Randy. Um, and uh, I, you mentioned learning uh, during the course of this uh, exercise. And I would certainly say for myself, uh, that I learned a great deal from you and the others about China. Uh, my career had not taken me to China, but I think all practitioners of foreign policy these days uh, need to know something about China. So it was a great learning experience for me. Um, I also want to thank the distinguished members of the study group um, and uh, the USIP staff, especially Jake Stokes, who pulled it all together and, uh, and uh, delivered this, uh, this product. So um, let me just say that in addition to Randy's excellent summary, I'll make a few points and then I'm sure our experts are going to uh, discuss all, you know, many of these ideas in, in much greater depth. But uh, to, to set the stage a little bit, let's say that for, for, the last 20, for much of the last 20 years, US policy toward South Asia has largely been framed by our war in Afghanistan uh, and counterterrorism policy more generally. Uh, this is shifting for several reasons. The first, uh, we are entering the end game in Afghanistan. But then I think um, more importantly, there's a bipartisan consensus on the need to deal with an increasingly assertive China, which as Randy mentioned, often pursues policies contrary to our interests. Uh, and while this consensus is probably something of a, still a work in progress, uh, it is reflected in our strategy for a free and open Indo-Pacific re region. Uh, as a result of this shift, there may be a temptation uh, for the United States to frame all its relationships in South Asia purely in terms of competition with China and countering malign Chinese behavior. Uh, but the SSG believed that uh, a more nuanced approach uh, may be called for. Uh, the SSG believes that our engagement with South Asia should be focused on problem solving and addressing the region's concerns. And it has to be said that for many of the, uh, the countries in the region and our South Asia, potential South Asian partners, these concerns center around economic uh, development. So just, just a few specific thoughts on some of, our, some of our thinking. And again, the experts uh, will be coming in and developing these ideas much more broadly. Uh, we do believe that we need to um, uh, strengthen uh, the concept of a free Indo-Pacific, um, which probably means uh, potentially expanding the Quad, which understanding that it will not harden into uh, a military alliance, 
uh, but still broadening the scope of our engagement across, uh, across the South Asian region and making use of some existing tools like the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the Blue Dot uh, Network. Uh, we need to, as Randy mentioned, continue to grow our partnership uh, with India, especially in strategic areas and facilitate cooperation across the whole spectrum of diplomatic, economic, technological, and military uh, engagement. Uh, we need to right-size our relationship with Pakistan, which means principally focusing on trade uh, and people-to-people -people relationships where we have great strengths, uh, but not necessarily competing directly with China in the area of economic development and recognizing uh, that we may share some common objectives with China with regard to the economic development of Pakistan. Um, and, but in, with regard to Pakistan, that we should have less of an emphasis on the military and security dimensions of the relationship uh, and focus more on, uh, on uh, the business relationship and people to people. For the smaller South Asian uh, states, and, and I would note that one of the themes that came out in our talks is that these, many of these states can only be considered smaller in comparison to the demographic behemoths of China and, uh, and India. Uh, many of them are quite substantial states in their own, but nonetheless, the smaller states uh, do not necessarily want to choose between being in the Chinese camp or the Indian camp. Uh, and they would not want their relationship uh, with the U.S. to be subcontracted, uh, say, to India. And so uh, the U.S. needs to pursue a policy of engagement with the smaller countries uh, as well in addressing their concerns. Um, finally, we do need to continue to pursue a political settlement in Afghanistan uh, and encourage China to play a constructive role uh, in that regard. Up until now, they have been rather reticent in any kind of uh, engagement um, in China. Um, and then just a few other thoughts to, uh, to hit on uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to Jake. Uh, Randy mentioned the importance of crisis management. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the interesting things about this study was that uh, we got to watch the Ladakh crisis in real time, um, actually, as we were touching on some of, these, uh, some of these topics. And we recognize that the increasing alignment of the United States with India and the increasing alignment of uh, China with Pakistan uh, makes it um, more difficult uh, for there to be an honest broker engaged uh, in crisis management, uh, a role that the United States has, has played uh, in the past. Uh, this is an easier problem to diagnose uh, than to come up with solutions for, but we do have some ideas uh, in the report for how to do it, including, I think, the important one that we need to do more quiet diplomacy ahead of time before crises actually erupt so that we can uh, be better positioned when things happen to actually uh, uh, make preparation, uh, to actually uh, intervene. Um, and then finally, I just want to uh, foot stomp something that, uh, that Randy mentioned, which is that um, while uh, we are recognizing that competition with China makes cooperation difficult uh, across the board, we did not neglect potential areas of cooperation with China. And probably these are areas that we would want to fence off uh, in the context of South Asia from our competition. And those would include uh, uh, countering the, um, uh, the coronavirus, uh, the question of uh, countering violent extremism in Afghanistan, but important to note, not at the expense of our associating ourselves with uh, Chinese counter, uh, violent, uh, countering violent extremism, if that's what it is, in Xinjiang. Uh, the dealing with questions of natural resources, especially water, uh, climate change, countering narcotics, and dealing humanely with refugee flows. Again, but again, we have to temper our expectation that there will be huge, um, uh, uh, that there will be huge areas where, uh, huge accomplishments in these areas, given the overall level of competition. Um, so why don't, why don't I stop there and turn it over to Jake, but uh, thanks for your attention. And again, congratulations to the group.
Thank you, Ambassador Olson. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jacob Stokes. I'm a senior policy analyst in the China program here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I have the honor of serving as the project director for this group. Um, now that we've heard from our distinguished project co-chairs, I want to turn to some of the esteemed members of our study group to get their perspectives on a few specific topics the group discussed. We're lucky to have several members uh, with us here today. So for the sake of clarity, I'll introduce each of them as I call on them. Uh, they all have very long and impressive uh, resumes, but to maximize the amount of time we get to hear from each of them directly, I'll just say their name, uh, title, and affiliation. Uh, but I would encourage you to go look at their credentials online. Uh, we'll also take questions from the audience after their remarks if we have some time. So please start sending those questions to us in the chat box. To ask a question, please use the chat box function located just below the video player on USIP's event page. If I can now, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Patrick Cronin, who is the Asia Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute. Uh, Patrick, as we've heard, the study group focused on China's influence uh, on South Asia. To understand how China approaches the region, though, we first need to understand a little bit more about the view from Beijing. Could you talk a little bit about how the group saw Beijing's assessment of South Asia and where the region fits in China's foreign policy uh, agenda? Randy talked a little bit about it earlier, but I wonder if you could add a little more detail along the way. Patrick? I will, I will do that, Jake. Uh, first. Let me thank the Institute of Peace, our co-chairs, the scholars for this great report. I hope it really guides US policy, it deserves to. So um, let me embroider on five points in answering your question about uh, Beijing's view of South Asia. The report captures the nuance. I'm gonna gloss over some of the nuance and give you my sort of personal take on some of these points. First is that China's rapid expansion in South Asia over the past two decades is a byproduct of regional trends as well as Beijing's policy design. So the fact that South Asian trade with China grew by more than 500% in the last decade is as much a testament to the region's progress as it is to Beijing's ambitions. But with the Belt and Road Initiative and a Blue Water Navy now second only to the US Navy, China's pushing into South Asia and the Indian Ocean with quite a bit of zeal. Xi Jinping aims to put China back on top after a century of repulsing imperial powers. For him, on the cusp of a third five-year term at the helm, Xi sees China's great rejuvenation requiring three things, internal security and unity at home, primacy over the periphery, and control over an integrated Eurasian continent and its adjacent maritime transit routes. All of these goals intersect South Asia. Point two is the importance of South Asia uh, because China's primary concern is actually still East Asia. Power remains concentrated in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia continues to be the most pliable and accessible subregion, yet China is increasingly looking west to achieve the level of security and prosperity it desires. Third, Beijing asserts that its expanding political, economic, and military footprint in South Asia is inherently defensive. Sovereignty is at stake. The rugged frontier separating the two powers is longstanding, but a more confident Beijing wants to solidify its territorial claims and certainly does not wish to cede any ground as the deadly skirmish in Ladakh this past summer suggests. Now countering the evils of terrorism, separatism and extremism as China sees it, requires more than a crackdown in Xinjiang and tighter control over Tibet. Western neighbors, including Afghanistan, must be stable to protect China's investments and friends. Managing a future India-Pakistan crisis that could escalate into a nuclear exchange is as important, I believe, to Beijing as preventing conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Geopolitically, moving into South Asia is necessary to avoid, a avoid encirclement with America's allies to the East. China wants to thwart reinforcements that could come from the West, say over a Taiwan scenario. Fourth, China's expanding influence in South Asia helps build a more Sinocentric Eurasian order, as Randy was suggesting. So while relatively conflict averse, China uses trade, investment, infrastructure, and other tools to establish greater connectivity on land, at sea, and digitally. Beijing expects that over time, South Asian countries will adopt China-friendly rules and standards rather than jeopardize such a critical relationship. Connectivity will put China in a position to influence the affairs of South Asian states better and help make South Asia both a bridge and a barrier to Africa and Europe. 
And finally, China wants to bring the Indian Ocean closer into range to make it an intermediate rather than a far sea. Randy Shriver pointed out that the graphic in the report is excellent, depicts PLA Navy milestones in the Indian Ocean over the last 15 years. Beginning with one naval exercise with Pakistan, China has pursued an ascending progression of deployments, activities, partners, and military capabilities. These culminated a year ago in a four-day China-Russia-Iran trilateral naval drill, Beijing's answer to the U.S.-India-Japan-Malabar exercise. Consolidating maritime control in the South China Sea is a springboard for projecting seaward and sea power westward. So, Jake, I hope that sheds a little more light on where South Asia fits into China's plan. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. And um, I want to move now to uh, Vikram Singh, who is a senior advisor in the Asia Center at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, Vikram, this year has seen a dramatic escalation in tensions on the China-India border. Could you characterize for us what the group saw in this year's events, perhaps on two levels? First, on the level of the prospects for peaceful management and eventual resolution of the border disputes. And second, on how Indian policymakers view the security implications of a stronger and more assertive China. Vikram? Uh, yeah, great. And thank you, Nick, and everyone. So, so great to see everybody. This was a, this was a tremendous group and a, and a fantastic project, Jake and Randy and Rick. Thank you for your leadership of this, uh, of this dynamic crew. Um, we, all, we all learned a lot. You know, talk about fascinating to have this project underway when, um, you know, the first uh, the first uh, deaths between the uh, between opposing Indian and Chinese forces up in the high Himalayas happens as we're looking at this issue. And, you know, it's it, it's an understatement to call it a shock. This was not something the Indians expected. I actually don't believe it was something the Chinese expected, even though they were the ones sort of pushing the envelope and uh, put and 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 escalating the the skirmishes and confrontations. I don't think they expected it to escalate to the level uh, that you would have 20 Indian uh, soldiers die and see India uh, pushed into having a, a fairly dramatic reaction. So, you know, to your to your first question, um, I think the 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 fact is that India and China have a long standing set of mechanisms in place to manage disputes and both seem interested in not having any more loss of life on their border. So you have everything from commander level talks all the way up to a, a channel of special representatives between the two countries that are designed to manage um, this, uh, this tense border from escalating into a crisis. And I think for the most part, we think they're probably going to be able to control escalation. But what this episode has exposed is that uh, while the Indians have generally hoped that eventually this is a path to a final resolution, the Chinese have viewed these mechanisms and this engagement with India much more like they view uh, the South China Sea or the, you know, and, and code of conduct discussions there, or even Taiwan, where it's an instrument for biding their time until they can get a disposition that's in, uh, in their favor. So uh, to Patrick's point about primacy in the periphery, for China, this is, um, this is one of the critical regions in which they want to establish that they um, are, have forces and capabilities such that India would be deterred from any kind of actions uh, of aggression, be that backing up foreign powers in some future war with China by causing trouble on their western flank, or be that uh, any kind of cross-border attacks like the Chinese saw the Indians doing uh, with Pakistan. So for the Chinese, it really is like we're going to get to the point that the Indians are totally deterred from any hostile activity across this frontier. And, you know, uh, in just the last couple of weeks, we've seen the Chinese and the Pakistanis do uh, joint air exercises. We've seen the head of the PLA visit not just Pakistan, but Nepal on his way to Pakistan. So the Chinese are continuing to signal to India, we're on your doorstep. Um, and they believe they can sort of do a, a, a cost imposition strategy on the Indians at this point too, especially in the wake of COVID, when Indian resources to invest in bolstering its defense capabilities are going to be at odds with India's need to take care of its population and its economy recovering from the from the pandemic. Um, for Indian policymakers, I think it's been a it's it's been a really un, 
you know, this has been an unfortunate shock and they feel a sense of betrayal. Um, they have tried to have a spirit of win-win cooperation with the Chinese through the Modi administration. Um, the Doklam crisis, the Indians chose to view as in 2017, thought that they sort of came out okay on that front. But what we've seen in the ensuing years is that the Chinese have consolidated their positions in Bhutan and actually just recently have built villages inside Bhutan. And they've taken it a step further with the actions on the LAC. So while the Indians saw that as a as establishing an equilibrium, the Chinese saw it as a predicate for further aggressive action on that frontier. India has responded with um, cutting off uh, access to uh, technology platforms for China. They've banned a lot of apps, over 100. Uh, they've instituted reviews of Chinese investments in Indian uh, technology and strategic sectors, even power, uh, even roads and those sorts of areas. Um, and there's a real chill in India-Chinese relations that we, have, um, we haven't seen uh, since they were at war decades ago. So I think, um, I think the, the, the fact is that that's the new reality that a U.S. administration faces is actually a lot more alignment in terms of concern between Delhi and Washington, and therefore a lot of potential for uh, greater strategic cooperation, uh, which I think the SSG highlights uh, very well. Thank you, Victor. And that was, that was really useful and to understand the trajectory of events on the border. I wanna turn now to Dr. Alyssa Ayers, who's Senior Fellow for India, Pakistan, and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations. Alyssa, one of the issues that growing Chinese influence in South Asia has really brought to the fore uh, in one of these areas of competition in a way um, is these are the different, different governing models between Asia's two most populous powers. India, of course, is the world's largest democracy, but the Modi government has been criticized for a number of illiberal actions. I wonder if you could contextualize for us the governance concerns against the backdrop of India-China relations. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. And let me just associate myself with all the previous thanks. I really thought this was a, a tremendous group and the discussions that we had over all these months, um, I think, really served to, to hone a set of findings and put together some deeply detailed information and recommendations for U.S. foreign policy on the region. I also think, by the way, that this report and the deep dive that the senior study group um, uh, embarked upon really served to highlight how important South Asia is as a region for really fully understanding China's approach, uh, its approach in the Belt and Road, certainly, its approach to uh, promoting its own model. And so I hope that others who read this fine report uh, will uh, come away with that same sense of how important South Asia is as a region in this global competition. So the governance piece is really important. I think one of the things that uh, was quite clear throughout the course of our discussion was the sense of how important India is, uh, not just in South Asia, but really as uh, a country that has done so much when you think about the model of democracy and what India has done over the course of decades. Um, its economic progress in recent decades, you know, India has lifted more than 270 million people out of extreme poverty in the decade from 2006 to 2016, that really has shown that the China model of denying political freedoms while emphasizing economic prosperity just wasn't the only pathway for large emerging economies to increase their own prosperity and lift citizens out of poverty. So in so many ways, India's accomplishments as a democracy, despite the well-known and well-documented problems that India has had over the decades, uh, have really served as an inspiration and a counterpoint to the China model. With China's deepened engagement uh, around the world and certainly across South Asia, as our group discussed, India's importance as the world's largest democracy and one of the world's largest economies as an emerging global power and one with a commitment to upholding international rule of law and freedom of nav navigation has really increased. And as this report notes, uh, a consensus has really emerged in the United States that the U.S. needs to enhance its strategic partnership with India for all of these reasons. The report recommends that Washington should deepen ties with India across diplomatic, economic, technology, and military areas, and that Washington also facilitate New Delhi's deepened cooperation with U.S. allies and partners in Asia and Europe. But 
uh, over the past year and a half in particular, as our group discussed over the months, concerns about Indian democracy have deepened, um, particularly following a pretty severe security crackdown in Kashmir uh, that was part of the abrogation of the region's traditional autonomy. Then a new law that for the first time introduced religion as a test for access to citizenship for refugees. Um, additional questions about prospects for a national citizenship exercise that could potentially leave many stateless. So our senior study group discussed these concerns too, because these developments have raised questions about the health of India's institutions of democracy, institutions like protection of minorities, freedom of expression and freedom of religion. And these are important components of any pluralist democracy. So while India does remain a robust electoral democracy, I would note here that India is the only country in South Asia that Freedom House gauges as free. Um, but Freedom House also noted in their report this year about Indian democracy that recent developments threaten the democratic future of a country that is long seen as a potential bulwark of freedom in Asia and the world. That's why this is important. And I'm quoting from that Freedom House report. So what we did in our report while emphasizing the importance of really broad gauged, a deepened partnership with India, uh, we also noted the importance for India's own interests and its global soft power appeal of upholding democratic traditions. I'm going to quote a little bit from our report because, I mean, I don't know who's watching and people may not be reading the report as we're talking now. So I'm just going to um, quote a little bit from it because I think it's really important. In addition to our uh, recommendation that the United States really deepen its partnership with India across the board, we also said that it's important for U.S. policymakers to note to leaders in New Delhi the view that India's democratic system, including its respect for pluralism and human rights, is a strategic asset. That strategic asset facilitates India's natural alignment with the United States and other democratic states around the world. And this system also refutes arguments made by Chinese leaders, among others, that democracy is inconsistent with Asian political culture. It allows India's vibrant and diverse society to be a strength rather than a weakness, and it enhances India's soft power throughout the region. Last quote from this section, similarly, American officials should underscore that recent illiberal steps in Kashmir and against India's Muslim population erode all those benefits, meaning the benefits of the soft power appeal, and that India's strategic importance cannot alone sustain the positive relations with other democracies that New Delhi will need to ensure its security. So I think the report is, is quite balanced in its emphasis while also noting that these are really important considerations as we look at the, uh, the method that China is employing in its uh, uh, promotion of its own system uh, across the region and the world. And the real power that India's pluralist democracy has held uh, as a form of appeal. Um, and so we've emphasized that that is something that Indian leaders should want to uh, uphold as a strategic asset themselves. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alyssa. This is a really important nuance on the balance that um, India, both Indian and US policymakers will have to strike uh, on governance issues. Um, on a sort of related topic, I want to turn to Anya Manuel, who's co-founder and partner at Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel LLC. Anya, uh, technology is becoming a bigger factor in global affairs generally, including, of course, in South Asia. Can you explain how the group thought about the role of technology in the region and as it relates to China across commercial, strategic, and normative dimensions? Thanks, Jake. And I agree with my colleagues. This was a wonderful working group. It's a really meaty, substantive report. So with lots of new recommendations. So to our friends and colleagues and press out there watching, I do recommend that you read it. Um, on the technology side, this of course is where the competition with China will be joined, both between the US and China and China and the South Asia region, especially technology powers like India. Technology impacts everything from our military preparedness to economic strength. So it's important. Uh, on tech, India and China were quite connected until this year. In 2019, China invested $3.9 billion in Indian startups. A lot of the biggest Chinese tech companies had an active presence in India. 
Uh, 70% of smartphones sold in India were Chinese, mostly Xiaomi and BBK. This all changed drastically after the Chinese incursions in Ladakh this summer. There were deepening concerns in India about how much engagement there had been with China and uh, really a determination to become less dependent on Beijing. And this took several forms. There were strikes and protests against Chinese technology. The Indian IT ministry as of today has blocked 200 Chinese apps saying that they're insecure. Alibaba, TikTok and others are cutting jobs in India. There was also some talk this fall of banning the telecom equipment from Huawei in 5G networks. But just two weeks ago in early December, the Indian government actually reversed course and has now included Huawei in working groups for rolling out 5G, especially in the healthcare and fintech sector. So that's a big reversal from where we were just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's not clear to me that the Indian government has a very clear security rationale here. It seems more designed to punish China rather than think through carefully what parts of Chinese technology are safe to cooperate with and which ones are probably more of a threat to India's long-term cybersecurity. So let's get to what can the US, India, the rest of the region do together on this front? And the report here had a lot of really thoughtful discussions. I'll just highlight some of them here. Um, one, with some strategic cooperation, India has the potential to become one of the real AI superpowers. It has a treasure trove of data, which of course is critical to this effort through Adhar and other government programs, incredible skills in programming and in artificial intelligence. So there could be a lot more cooperation between the US universities and the IITs, for example, on AI than there has been. That's one. Two, we always talk about visas in, in India, US relations, but it's time. We've got to restore the H-1B visas that were cut a lot under the Trump administration, make it easier for Indian students to study here and vice versa, because it helps the US to attract the best talent from South Asia to develop our own cutting edge technology and to continue the important cooperation that it already exists. Three, there's been a lot of talk in Washington about creating a Tech 10 group of countries. It's in different forms. I've written about it. I know Martin Rasser at CNAS has, um, Richard Fontaine and some others, the idea that um, technology companies would cooperate, technology powers would cooperate on things like standards, ensuring that the West remains in the lead on semiconductors, a whole host of things. And India, of course, should be a part of that. Four, India can play a very important role in collaborating on ethical standards for technology. It took a very important step in that direction by joining the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence this summer, along with a lot of our friends, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, the UK, Germany, uh, to really think through what should the norms be for AI. That's a very important first step. And then a lot more can be done from there. For example, coordinating with India on ethical standards for digital surveillance, of which China is doing a whole lot, and a lot of soft power things to start countering um, China's digital silk roads. Finally, and this is, I think, the most important, there needs to be some quiet coordination and dialogue between the countries in South Asia the US and East Asian countries to address Chinese disinformation and some gray zone tactics. For example, there could be a lot more done to share best practices for countering foreign influence in domestic politics and elections. Taiwan and Japan have a whole lot of expertise in this area. They've done really well and they could lend some of that expertise, frankly, to us here in the US, but also to India, Sri Lanka, lots of other folks in the region who are struggling with that. That highlights just some of the things we talked about in the report, and I'll pass it back to you, Jake.
Well, thank you, Anya. That uh, was really, really helpful and, and lays out a pretty robust agenda for diplomacy, not just between ministries of foreign affairs, but also ministries that cover other technical issues. So uh, a lot for U.S. policymakers and regional policymakers to dig into. I'd like to move now to Dan Markey, who's the Senior Research Professor in International Relations at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, Dan, the study group uh, devoted a good portion of its work to looking at China-Pakistan relations and the implications of closer alignment between Beijing and Islamabad. Could you tell us a little bit about where the relationship stands today and share how the group assessed China's influence specifically on domestic politics and political economy uh, in Pakistan? Sure. Thanks, Jake. Uh, first, of course, like the others, I'd like to commend you and the co-chairs and USIP, uh, not just for putting together a great report, but for running a fantastic process. Uh, it really was uh, first rate. And having tried to do similar things in the past myself, I can say it's not easy and you made it look easy. So thank you. Um, three points on the China-Pakistan relationship. Uh, point one, uh, the report correctly observes that the uh, military to military relationship is at the core, the defining feature of China-Pakistan relations. And this extends into uh, nuclear and missile technologies as well as conventional arms. So this is, this is the core of the relationship. Point two, what is really new uh, and has been new over about the past decade or so has been China's intensified and high profile attention to Pakistan's uh, economy and its more ambitious role in Pakistan's economic development. So we've seen the dramatic launch in 2015 of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And even while the most ambitious forecasts for CPEC, this China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, haven't been lived up to, this hasn't been the so-called fate changer that some suggested it would might be, um, even so, the economic links between China and Pakistan uh, are quite significant in terms of investment, bilateral trade, uh, and continuing loans. Um, so this is, this is also becoming more central to the relationship. Point three, both the military ties and the economic ties have clear political consequences uh, that we cannot overlook. Um, as the most powerful actor in Pakistan state, the army uh, not only sees uh, China as a guarantor on the security front, but also sees it as a guarantor in domestic political terms as well. Uh, and in addition to that, Pakistan's entrenched elite establishment uh, power brokers uh, are, it seems, along with the army, best positioned to extract the greatest benefit from these increasing economic ties between China and Pakistan. And so we have reasons to be concerned that the benefits of CPEC and these other features of the economic ties will principally accrue to a thin minority uh, of Pakistanis rather than a broad majority uh, of the population. Now, this is partly because China itself uh, doesn't seem to have any kind of a deep interest in promoting um, any kind of a democratic or more liberal practice in Pakistan. And it may not uh, necessarily want to impose its own model, um, but it's certainly uh, not going to place the types of uh, pressures for what we might consider to be um, healthy reforms, either, either economic or political reforms, that would encourage, among other things, greater foreign direct investment by non-Chinese sources, including the United States. Uh, because these types of pressures are more now more easily brushed off uh, due to uh, China's backing of Pakistan. And there is nothing about China's involvement in Pakistan um, that's likely to help alienated minorities, uh, progressive-minded politicians, uh, or others in Pakistan who tend to oppose what seems to be an increasingly illiberal and army-dominated state. And this is worrisome. So all told, uh, the report uh, adds up these pieces, uh, and I'll quote it, it concludes that, quote, the China-Pakistan access is strengthening, which has a detrimental effect on governance and economic reform efforts in Pakistan, given the concomitant lack of transparency and accountability, 
Uh, and I think that's quite right and well placed. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I, that was uh, really useful to understand the uh, domestic political economy of the uh, relationship. I want to turn now uh, to uh, Samir Lal Lalwani, who's a senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. Um, Samir, the deepening China-Pakistan partnership has major foreign policy implications in addition to the domestic policy implications Dan just noted. Um, would you walk us through a little bit how the group considered China's impacts on India-Pakistan dynamics generally and crisis management specifically? Great. Thanks, Jake, for the question. And also to you, Randy, Rick, and Jennifer for leading this very illuminating study group where I learned a lot and benefited a lot um, from, from the process. So I think you're right. Your question picks up from Dan's points about uh, the deepening military economic ties having political consequences. In this case, uh, certainly geopolitical consequences. So if I was to use a word to describe the effect, uh, I realize it wasn't in the report, but I think it's an apt term, which is I think China is driving a re of the region, whether by design or by accident, by making the region more competitive in peacetime and possibly possibly more dangerous in, in crisis time. So let me unpack those, those two points. Um, so I think China's impact certainly makes the region more competitive in peacetime through these economic and diplomatic and military investments. The uh, economic investments and diplomatic support for Islamabad uh, certainly helps to bolster Pakistan's confidence. That can be uh, a good thing in some ways, but it can also elicit some security dilemma dynamics where New Delhi may fear a more emboldened Pakistan or may or Pakistan may be more assertively knowing it has uh, Chinese backing either diplomatically or politically. Um, it also is having a material effect in enhancing Pakistan's military capabilities. Uh, this is through the sales and co-production of advanced weaponry, tanks, frigates, uh, new submarines, uh, missiles, radar systems, and even the co-production of, of fighter aircraft. Uh, it's incurring through deeper intelligence cooperation and more complex military exercises, and even access to Chinese reconnaissance surveillance targeting acquisition assets, uh, like satellites for, for better, better miss, missile targeting. Um, and so with the, the enhancement of Pakistan's military, it also facilitates the third condition of potentially allowing for Chinese power projection through Pakistan if it seeks it in the future. Uh, and because their, their equipment systems and logistics will be shared or in the future will be more greater, uh, there'll be a greater overlap and uh, possible interoperability. So all these features may not necessarily be guided by some grand design, but we can't help but observe how they create some, a real simultaneity dilemma or problem for, for India. It complicates uh, India's military planning, as, as Randy had uh, alluded to earlier, and it can constrain New Delhi, which the report describes. Uh, and it may even neutralize some cr critical components of, of the US Indo-Pacific strategy as we, uh, you know, how, how it's been envisioned from, from Washington. So another way in which China may impact the region is by making it more dangerous uh, when India and Pakistan crises uh, inevitably arise, um, and we've seen sort of an uptick of them in, in recent years. So in the past, the report notes that uh, China, pre previously China was actually quite constructive in, in backstopping U.S. crisis management efforts. Um, and a lot of the crisis management theory that we've, we've come to know over the last couple decades, uh, you know, whether it's sort of described as brokered bargaining of pivotal deterrence, um, it operated under a systemic condition of unipolarity. So obviously that condition has changed, whether we want to describe it as bipolarity or multipolarity, and this just makes crisis management more difficult. China is undoubtedly a major patron and player that can alter the structure of the game. And uh, without easy great power cooperation or a structure sort of guided by the unipole, crisis management can break down and crises can accelerate or spiral through several avenues. So even uh, with the best of intentions, they can spiral accidentally where you have multiple actors struggling to coordinate and share information during crisis, crises, especially when they're in communication with different actors. Inadvertently, you could have um, two states uh, operating with different theories of de-escalation and crisis management that may be working at cross purposes. And we might've seen a little bit of that playing out during the Balico crisis in 2019. But you could also envision a world in the future where there might be deliberate efforts um, to accelerate or intensify uh, crises. Uh, some scholars have suggested that China may simply view South Asia as a zero sum game where any win for India is a loss for Beijing. So it'll do whatever it takes to prevent that. And it's not uh, a given, but it's a possibility that we have to start to consider in <clears throat> crisis management um, planning. So I guess to sum up, whether it's intentional or not, China's impact on the region 
principally through this deepened relationship with Pakistan, has undoubtedly created peacetime and crisis time dilemmas for India, and in turn has created challenges for U.S. interests and strategy in the region. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Samir. As, as you noted, it's an extremely complex uh, set of dynamics there. Um, so that was very helpful in helping us unpack them. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to turn to uh, uh, Nalanthi here in a second, but I want to remind everyone watching that if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the chat box uh, and we will turn to those questions uh, shortly. Uh, so with that, let me uh, introduce uh, Nalanthi Samaranayaka, who is the Director of the Strategy and Policy Analysis Program at CNA. Uh, Nalanthi, the group also explored China's ties with the other relatively, as Rick said, smaller states in South Asia, namely Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, uh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. It noted the China story is a little bit different for each case in each country, depending on a lot of factors. But can you talk about some of the general trends uh, we identified for this set of countries? How is China changing the landscape for them? Sure. Uh, well, th uh, thanks, Jake. Um, and, and I'd also like to express my thanks to my SSG colleagues, uh, including Randy, Rick, and Jennifer for their leadership of the group. We heard from Randy and Rick their comments about the smaller South Asian countries, so I'll add on to those. Uh, yes, we did note the variation among smaller South Asian countries, ranging from Bangladesh, which has been a long-standing recipient of Chinese arms sales, uh, and then contrasting that to Bhutan, which has no formal diplomatic ties with China and a close relationship with India. We also included Afghanistan, which has a very unique set of circumstances due to the past 20 years of US military presence. But despite this variation, we did find some general themes among the smaller South Asian countries, namely economics and domestic politics. So we discussed how China is the largest source of bilateral imports for many of the smaller South Asian countries. And this can be attributed to China's role as a global manufacturing hub. But we did note that the exports from these countries going to China, they're often much smaller. And more frequently, these countries' largest export markets are actually the United States or India or European countries. So this is something that is is not as well understood. And these countries, of course, are seeking to boost exports for their growing economies. Now, beyond trade, Chinese tourism before the pandemic was an important source of income to these countries, especially Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. So this is, of course, lacking now uh, during the, the COVID uh, period. We talked about financing and how China is one of the largest bilateral investors in the region, notably through infrastructure projects. And this is especially the case in the maritime countries, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. Uh, we've seen this through seaport projects and airport projects. And we, we found both a problem and a prospect here. So on the one hand, there's been a lot of attention to mounting debt burdens from China for some of the smaller, South Asian countries that are already struggling with wider debt issues. But then on the other hand, China does provide an option when smaller South Asian countries cannot get support elsewhere from Japan or the World Bank. Also, China's financing and construction can help aid connectivity in one of the least integrated regions in the world, South Asia. So this can be a public good, but we were in agreement that there needs to be a way to get there to that end state with infrastructure projects on balance being a sustainable endeavor for these countries. We also talked about domestic politics and some of the smaller South Asian country leaders essentially the role of Chinese cash and Chinese involvement in local politics. And this has often been discussed in Sri Lanka and Maldives, but the group observed this issue in the case of Nepal as well. So really the bottom line takeaway uh, for this is we, we think that attention to the smaller South Asian countries is likely to increase as strategic competition between China and the US also increases. And it really suggests an opportunity for the United States to deepen its engagement 
across the smaller South Asian countries on a variety of issues, especially economics. Great. Thank you, Noamthi. Uh, that was really useful in illuminating um, the number of factors uh, we have to consider in assessing China's role in the smaller South Asian states. Um, we're, we're getting some questions in from the audience, but while we go through those, I wonder if I could turn back to Alyssa and uh, ask if you could talk for a minute uh, just briefly about uh, India's response to China's diplomatic forays into South Asia, specifically with the smaller South Asian states. Um, and what, what is New Delhi's assessment and uh, do, how is their policy changing as a response? Well, I think India has been pretty active uh, diplomatically around the region, particularly with Bangladesh, with Sri Lanka, um, with Maldives, and with Nepal more recently. Um, I, you know, for India, it's important to ensure that it does have uh, solid working relationships with the countries that are on its border. And during the period for some of some of the relationships uh, and some of the tensions that India has had with countries in the region like Maldives and Sri Lanka has had more to do with the governments in power in those other countries than it has had to do, I believe, with India's foreign policy approach to those countries. So you can see, for example, that from 2015 forward, you saw a real pendulum swing in India's relationship with Sri Lanka once a new government that was not the Rajapaksas was elected to power. Now. You're seeing a possible pendulum shifting back to a real emphasis on ties with China. Um, and New Delhi is really picking up its engagement with Colombo to make sure that it can retain really strong relationship there with a country that is really geopolitically quite important. You saw, you know, the National Security Advisors trilateral meeting just, what, uh, 10 days ago uh, between um, uh, India, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. Um, the same pattern actually has been the case with Maldives. Once there was uh, a shift in power with the government in Maldives, you saw a much more of a tilt back towards a deepened engagement with India. Um, Nilanthi has done so much work on this, um, but you can really see for Maldives in particular, they've been trying to really assess the uh, extent of their economic, their debt exposure to China. That's been something that's been a real preoccupation of the current government there. And of course they uh, uh, have a strong and are continuing to build a stronger security relationship with India. Um, and that has been a high priority for New Delhi. Um, uh, with Bangladesh as well, Bangladesh is just a vitally important country for Indian security and India has had a strong relationship with the current government in Bangladesh, particularly given that government's emphasis on counterterrorism and ensuring that Bangladesh um, cannot be used as a uh, staging ground or planning ground for terrorist attacks that could target India. Um, but things have become a little bit more tense, I'd say, over the course of the last nearly one year as a result of some of the domestic developments in India that have occurred, particularly in light of the um, uh, uh, issues involving India's National Register of Citizens in the state of Assam and some of the public comments that have been made by some senior Indian politicians uh, about Bangladeshis. So there has been some tension introduced in that relationship where the foreign policy has been uh, uh, you know, quite robust and strengthening ties, but some of India's domestic developments have uh, added a new tension to that relationship. Great. Well, thank you, Alyssa. That was really illuminating. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about, um, there's been a lot of media coverage um, related to the Belt and Road Initiative and, and, and more broadly, and specifically um, the port of Gwadar in Pakistan. I wonder if I could turn to Dan uh, to talk a little bit about your view uh, on that project, because it seems to really encapsulate um, a lot of the fears about Chinese influence in the region. And I wonder, but also its influence in some ways on domestic politics, but also the risks for Beijing um, in having an expanded, role, uh, an expanded role in a sometimes volatile region. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the group saw that project in the context of China's larger strategy. Of course, yeah. Um, so Gwadar Port, for, for anybody who's unfamiliar, uh, is this uh, deep sea port project along the Arabian seacoast of Pakistan. 
And it's, it's relevant uh, in, in many ways. Strategically, I think a lot of folks in the United States and in India and elsewhere uh, have placed it in the context of this potential string of pearls of bases and places of Chinese military access along the, um, so the, the rimlands of, of, uh, of Asia. Uh, and have raised all kinds of concerns about what that means for the projection of Chinese military power, particularly naval power uh, throughout the region. And if you think about it over the long term, uh, there is a, a broad strategic concern that water, among other things, uh, offers China the unusual potential for overland access through Pakistan down to the Arabian Sea. And so this can create headaches, strategic headaches uh, for the United States in the long term. Having said that, uh, there are a number of important things to appreciate about the challenges associated with Gwadar. Uh, this isn't a simple project and it's not an easy part of Pakistan. And China has learned this uh, in part because it's in Balochistan, which is uh, the site of an active insurgency uh, inside of Pakistan, which has at times targeted Chinese workers and Pakistani workers associated with this project. So there's a, there's a lot of unrest uh, in Pakistan not just driven by water, but exacerbated by uh, projects like this. So there's no clear evidence that this will necessarily work as a large scale project, uh, certainly not one that's going to inspire um, economic or commercial growth uh, in that part of Pakistan. Last point though, uh, this isn't just a, a Chinese plan, a grand strategy uh, sort of to place China's uh, flag inside of Pakistan. This was a, initially a Pakistani project for Pakistani, developed for Pakistani strategic and to some degree economic, uh, to meet economic needs, uh, delivered or, or uh, initially uh, brought to Beijing by then President Musharraf, uh, who implored the Chinese to invest there. And so what this reflects here is also the, I think something we see across the region, the kind of the push and pull uh, it's not just a matter of China asserting itself on the region as if the region uh, is a passive recipient of Chinese power. It's also the region pulling China in, framing, constraining, uh, and having a clear effect on China's uh, potential uh, ambitions, short, medium, and long term. And I think that's something that we talked a lot about a fair amount in the group and, and worth uh, recalling as we think about how these dynamics are likely to evolve over the, over the long time. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, we have a question from the audience, uh, sort of related to your the the push pull point um, about China's influence uh, and building ties with political parties within certain states in the region. Uh, Nalanthi, I wonder if I could turn back to you uh, to talk about a little bit about how that's playing out. Um, I know there's been a lot of coverage, especially related to the Sri Lanka and Maldives case, um, but maybe share with us. Um, a, a little bit about the the dynamics of China's ties with political parties um, in in the region, if you can. Sure, Jake. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of the the most high profile case has been the Sri Lanka case and uh, the the Rajapaksa leadership's uh, relationships with China. It's been reported in the New York Times about how close that that relationship has been. Uh, and then I'll, I'll also echo Dan's point about uh, Gwadar. We also saw a similar situation with Hambantota port, uh, with the Sri Lankans really trying to push that and develop that as opposed to Sri Lanka being a, a passive recipient about um, you know, Chinese interest in, in trying to uh, develop that port. Um, so uh, the, the Rajapaksa leadership at the time certainly reached out uh, to, to India uh, for support on that uh, and also to the United States uh, for uh, investment in that project. Uh, so uh, um, definitely uh, that's the case uh, in the Hamantota project in Sri Lanka. Uh, but to your point, uh, Jake, I think the the Rajapaksa leadership uh, has been probably the most prominent example of uh, China's relationship uh, with uh, uh, leaders um, in or at least regime uh, level relationships. Um, we also saw that in Maldives with President Yamin as well. Um, but um, it, it was interesting to me in our discussions uh, among the SSG is uh, we also talked about observing that trend in Nepal most recently with the, the Chinese ambassador being quite vocal uh, in, in uh, Nepal discussions um, and, and with regard to the, the party there. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's 
certainly a trend that we have seen uh, across multiple countries uh, in South Asia, particularly the smaller South Asian countries. Um, but to me, a question remains is to, to what extent will, will that be effective? We're, we're starting to see uh, the, the new Rajapaksa leadership um, under Gotabaya in Sri Lanka. Um, there, there's been news coming out of Sri Lanka about um, they, they may actually be receptive to the, the East Container Terminal Project, uh, which would be a partnership uh, with India and Japan um, on the ground, uh, essentially in Colombo port, um, uh, where there is already a Chinese terminal project there. Uh, so to me, a question in my mind is, how will these leaders of smaller South Asian countries reflect back? Because there has been a lot of learning taking place in looking at the previous uh, experience of the, the earlier Rajapaksa administration, uh, the Yamin administration in uh, Maldives, and what we're seeing now in Nepal taking place. Yeah, great. That's that's fascinating. Um, and uh, Alyssa, you have a two finger. Just really quickly, uh, you know, I've observed over the last really since the pandemic and, and since so much has moved to virtual, it, it strikes me that we are also seeing a kind of new or more engaged type of diplomatic outreach from China to these countries. And that's through the diplomatic engagement of the Chinese Communist Party itself, in addition to all the activity that comes from, of course, the, the foreign ministry, which is normally in charge of foreign policy. Um, but they've done, you know, video engagements, party to party um, with a, a lot of these countries. So I don't know what that will suggest for the future. But to me, that seems like a kind of new dimension over the course of the last nearly one year. Yeah, that's a great point. We've seen a, a lot more work from the International Department uh, of the CCP around the region. And those ties are often, as you suggested, fly under the radar. Um, in these general topics, we hear a lot about the, the quad grouping as sort of a response to China's uh, growing role in the region. I wonder if I could turn just to Patrick really quick and, and uh, to give us your, your sort of take on, on whether the quad, but also should that, be, uh, a, a, should that be the main venue for US policy uh, in the Indo-Pacific region as a counterbalance uh, to China's growing role? No is the short answer, uh, Jake. Um, it should be one of many uh, possible groupings uh, on which to build or which to hold just with the four countries. Um, I, we saw with uh, China's uh, naval push in the Indian Ocean, not just back to Malabar, but it's also a response in part. China flexing muscle in the Indian Ocean is partly a response to the quadrilateral security uh, dialogue that uh, comprises India, Japan, the United States, and Australia. Um, so when the United States uses closer security relations with India, uh, you can expect China to push back in different ways, either tightening cooperation with uh, Pakistan. We heard about providing missile uh, sort of accuracy data that Samir talked about um, to Pakistan um, or uh, seeking military exercises, sending submarines to the region. China has many ways to respond. It's important for the United States to expand the strategic partnership with India and to engage more deeply in the region, but at the same time to understand there's a cost to any kind of grouping, specific grouping, that looks like it's coming at China's expense. So when we do that, if we do that, it needs to be very specific. It needs to be differentiated. We need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve. It needs to be realistic in terms of its objectives. Um, and at the same time, not uh, jettison the many things that uh, Rick was talking about at the beginning that are in the report that we want to try to um, fence off and hope to build cooperation with China because every country in South Asia wants a degree of cooperation with, with China. Yeah, that fascinating, uh, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to move now, and, and sorry to move uh, topics so quickly, but there was a question about sort of re-engaging uh, Pakistan um, and the extent to which China should be kind of the frame for uh, such an approach. I wonder if I could turn to Samir um, for any thoughts uh, he might have on that as an idea. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, I mean, I think the you know, one of the central points of the report is uh, how we need to deepen relationship our relations with New Delhi and with India on, on a whole host of fronts. But I think a point that the report also makes is that we shouldn't simply cede 
uh, our relationship with Pakistan to China. There's definitely, uh, we can see potential camps emerging, but there's no reason we have to uh, submit to that entirely. We can still remain competitive in that. I think in some ways, the, the current administration has kind of reset the game w- or the relationship with Pakistan, which allows for a, a future where we engage with new tools as opposed to relying on sort of the previous uh, predominantly military assistance tools um, there are other ones in the report that we described that are similar to how we'd engage the rest of the region, economic, trade, uh, visa regimes, also, you know, intelligence and counterterrorism cooperation. There are shared interests and in, uh, new tools that we could uh, use to, to work with Pakistan so that they're not simply boxed into being uh, a Chinese junior partner, but instead have have options. And, and I think there are um, there are indications of fissures that, you know, may deepen over time. So there may be you know, greater opportunity in the future. Uh, between China and Pakistan. I mean, certainly they've done a very good job of covering uh, or tamping down on uh, concerns about uh, the Uyghurs, but periodically you hear um, ministers or, you know, religious figures raise that issue uh, uh, in Xinjiang and just generally how China uh, engages with Muslim population. Um, there's, there's bound to be friction points. It's come up uh, with Chinese workers uh, within Pakistan itself, but also um, in some ways, China might be assuming some of the challenges the United States had for the last 20 years, which was there's a whole host of augmented expectations uh, that when they go unmet, create um, some some frustration, disillusionment. So whether that's on the military side with some disappointments about the effectiveness of the JF-17 as a platform, or on the economic side with uh, short shortfalls in, in, in CPEC delivery uh, relative to the promises and expectations that Dan described, uh, described um, Th- those will be opportunity points uh, for us to, to to reengage and we should we should take these opportunities when they when they come to us yeah th- thanks samir I th- that's a great point and i wonder if i can ask uh, ambassador olson to come in on this because he has some very personal experience uh, and deep knowledge in this uh, area of engaging pakistan yeah thanks uh, thanks jake and i agree totally with uh, samir's take uh, on uh, the nature of the relationship i don't think there's any question that over time um, our perception of our relationship with Pakistan may may very well be shaped by Pakistan's <clears throat> relationship with China, um, but I don't think that means uh, that we should, in agreeing with with uh, with Samir, simply walk away from our longstanding relationship with China. Um, a couple of points um, in that regard. You know, as we get into an Afghan endgame, and as we uh, are really uh, approach a political settlement to the conflict um, in Afghanistan. I think there will be some temptation uh, on the part of Washington to walk away from what has been, frankly, a very dysfunctional relationship with with Pakistan for the past um, uh, the past twenty years. Uh, Pakistanis might say it has been for the past uh, thirty years, but. Uh, It's important um, that we not totally cede, I think, uh, some of the strains of our relationship, and and those include potentially um, areas of uh, uh, opportunities for U.S. business, opportunities for trade between uh, Pakistan and the United States, and especially in the people-to-people area where we have uh, a a fairly important legacy that I think we'd want to maintain. And one of the reasons we'd want to do it, in addition to, first of all, we do ha- we do need Pakistan for the Afghanistan endgame. Um, it, it will be important uh, to arriving at a political settlement to have Pakistan's influence used in productive ways with the Taliban. Uh, but then I think also one of the themes that we developed in this report is the da- the potential dangers of having inner inner Asia sort of harden into two alliance camps, um, and uh, and the implications for crisis management. I mean, the United States has played a very important role uh, along the at, in conflicts uh, along the, the line of control, um, and it would be a mistake for the United States to, I think, entirely cede. Uh, that role, especially when we um, perceive that China may be not prepared to step up and and play um, as responsible a role as we would like. Uh, So we need to maintain influence with both sides, uh, with both India and Pakistan, uh, for the sake of preventing, uh, helping to prevent uh, what is potentially uh, the crossing of the nuclear threshold. 
A, a very sobering uh, point to end on, certainly. Um, I want to pose one more question to the group and get several um, uh, of the members' inputs on the idea. Um, one of the, the big themes, uh, I think, that any work on China and uh, deals with, grapples with these days is uh, which Chinese behavior to oppose and which Chinese behavior to um, accept or even facilitate. And this, of course, applies uh, in South Asia. I wonder if I could turn to Randy and then maybe Anya or others uh, to talk about how we um, how we thought about those questions and a little bit about where we came down. Um, I, I'm not sure there was absolute agreement on it between every member of the group, uh, but I think there were some general principles. Yeah, and I think it's challenging because, you know, areas where you would say are more sort of benign or, or Chinese contributions can lift all boats, you still suspect there are motives there about increasing leverage and influence and ultimately wanting to use that for uh, malign intent in other circumstances. But um, yeah, I think our group basically discussed our position as being resource constrained. And there are some areas where we just aren't going to be able to uh, maybe make substantial enough investment to be competitive with China dollar for dollar. And so to uh, really look at their activities that could more directly impact our interests, particularly security interests. So where their uh, development assistance, for example, is, is more directly related to opening opportunities for access for the PLA and, and maybe have a more direct security impact. Uh, we need to pay more attention to that. Um, but again, as, as Rick and others have said, um, you know, keeping an open mind to cooperating where our interests do potentially align. And I think the new administration will have opportunities, whether that's climate change or sort of um, recasting the whole discussion about response to COVID and, and cooperation in those areas. So I, I think the it's a difficult task to disaggregate these different activities. And you're right, our, our group didn't necessarily reach a final view of it. Um, but I think, uh, as I said, where, where our security interests and, and those of our partners are most directly impacted, I think that's where uh, our attention would be. Just to double down on what Randy said on two points. One, countering China and the region, especially with BRI and other things, we're not gonna compete with the Chinese loan for loan and we don't need to. I think what the, the West needs to do is BRI and, and some of the digital Silk Road in particular has within it the seed of its own downfall. You can already see countries pushing back, Nalante mentioned Sri Lanka, but you see it all over Africa as well, where actually people are turning away from money that isn't no longer even so cheap <laughs> and, and surveillance technology and saying, well, actually maybe good governance does help us and, and just emphasizing the values that the West stands for and continuing to be a good partner to these countries, I think will in the long run serve us better than trying to compete with the Chinese dollar for dollar. And to the second point that Randy made about where can you actually cooperate with China? Um, you know, everyone keeps tossing, including President elect Biden keeps saying climate change and the pandemic. And I hope we can find that and many other places to cooperate with China. But I worry that very quickly, even on those two big issues, you run into trouble. Because when you hear the folks coming into a Biden administration saying, let's cooperate with China on climate change, what they mean is, let's get China to do more than they committed to in Paris. <laughs> the US will rejoin Paris, and then let's push China to make real concessions. So very quickly, that becomes a more complicated negotiation. And same with COVID. We can say we're going to cooperate, but are the Chinese really going to um, now open up and say, where did it come from? There's a little bit of cooperation since we got the sequencing of the virus immediately. But I worry that um, we'll talk a big game about cooperation and actually there'll be it'll be harder than we think. Vikram, you were shaking your head. I wonder if you want to get in on this point. Um, you no, know, I mean, Randy and Anya covered it really well. I, I would just one point is on the on the on BRI investment, there is this sort of self-correcting mechanism. And, you know, one of the questions is going to be, 
um, will the Chinese be constrained in what they're what they're the, the demands of them. So when they want to make investments, are countries learning to impose standards and requirements and things like that that would actually make BRI investments relatively innocuous. Now, the pandemic has upset that a little bit because I think BRI investments going to drop just as a function of economic of the economic downturn. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we might find ourselves thinking that's a little bit un even unfortunate because some of the investments that could have come out of China would be generally positive if they're in water and some basic transportation infrastructure we could all benefit from as Nalanthi was talking about um you know but the 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 fundamental question is going to be um does china also expect concessions in exchange for cooperation on these areas that we see as critically important so if if climate change is the existential threat that i think many people view it as and cooperation with china and other countries is is um, necessary condition for for progress that's adequate to meeting that challenge. What is China going to ask for explicitly or implicitly demand in exchange for that kind of accelerated cooperation? Is there some sort of deal they're going to want to put on the table? We'll we'll go you know many miles on climate in exchange for basically more tolerance of the of the Chinese of the Chinese view about how this region should be ordered and things like that. I think those are actually real questions that we're going to face and there will be choices. I think it's going to be very hard, as Anya says, to find much grounds for uh, greater collaboration, even though there's areas where we should be able to collaborate, you know, as we did with the Soviet Union on things like, you know, the ozone hole in the 1980s. Alyssa, you, you've served in government as well. I wonder if, if you want to come in on on uh, how U.S. policymakers might be, be thinking about those trade-offs. Uh, I don't have anything more substantial to add to Vikram's smart comments there. I, I do think that when it comes to these big questions of, you know, essentially the global commons, these big problems that we can't solve on our own and that we really do need to be working with other countries that have a major global impact to solve, um, uh, you know, India becomes all the more important as well for that same reason, for the same reason that uh, uh, China's footprint on climate change is important. Well, India is also important, not to the same extent. Their per capita emissions are much lower, obviously, but um, uh, we need to be thinking about how we can advance these global commons goals for the good of the earth, for the good of the planet. Great. Well, I think that's a, a really important point uh, to end on. And so let me uh, wrap it up there. Um, and let me just end also with uh, expressing my thanks uh, both to the co-chairs and to all the members of this group. Uh, it's been a hectic year um, for everybody. And there was a, a, a very large investment of time and energy and, and sort of intellectual or not sort of lots of intellectual capital um, that uh, we were able to channel at the staff level. So thank you very much. Um, for that. It truly was, as, as Randy suggested, a little bit like working uh, with the dream team um, on, on this particular issue set. Um, so uh, with that, I have to plug the report one more time. We hope everyone will go and read it on the USIP website. Uh, happy holidays to everyone. Uh, stay safe and thanks again. Happy holidays. Thank you.